how does that, how would you relate that or how would you compare that to Rand's view, epistemological view? And in if for both, um, say something about induction and, 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 yeah. and how that plays a role. Yeah, so Popper thinks the two things. So one is induction is not a valid source of knowledge. But he also thinks, and this is a little different, that no one ever actually thinks inductively either. So other inductive skeptics would say, yeah, I mean, you do this all the time, don't you? You see one white swan, another white swan, another white swan, and you generalize it. So, no, that's not really what we do. It's not just that that's invalid. We don't even do that as Popper's view. What we do is we kind of have a hypothesis maybe suggested to us by our experience or by testimony from other people. Uh, you see a couple of swans and you hypothesize, oh, maybe swans are white. And then what you actually do is hold on to that until you can subject it to criticism. So I saw a bunch of white swans. I haven't seen any non-white swans. So I hold this hypothesis in my mind. And if I'm really like actively thinking about this for some reason, what I would do is try to find a non-white one. And so there's no generalization, really. There's just suggestion of a speculation or a conjecture. So he's an anti-inductivist. There's no inductive generalizing. It's not, not something we do psychologically. And even if we did do it, it's not a valid form of reasoning. Now that's in contrast with Rand, who's you know a champion of induction of the inductive method. You get this from her um, her writing, and you get it even more if you're uh, um, learning objectivism from Leonard Peikoff. He really hammers this home, um, especially hard that the way to know anything is ultimately through some kind of inductive process that starts with sense perception, um, and then you know details need to be filled in, but you go from sense perception up to your most abstract idea. It's all rooted in sense perception and uh, um, proved or validated by a process of induction. So yeah, we would be, we would definitely be in the bad camp according to Prop Popper, objectivists would. <laughs> so, um, so how do these two relate? Well, I mean, they're, they're about as without, unless you want to include skepticism in here, they're about as far apart as you can get. So for Popper, there's no proof, there's no um, certainty in science, uh, there's no um, induction, there's only, he has the view that it sort of doesn't matter where you get your hypotheses from. Mm -hmm. So to him, there's just sort of two different questions. There's like, where did my hypothesis come? And then what do I do with it epistemologically? And where you get your hypothesis from is psychology, biography. It's not epistemology. But it, is it is where you get the hypothesis from, is it intrinsic in some way? That is, are the hypotheses there inside your mind to be discovered? Um, no, no. So he... There's not Plato in that sense. No. So he's he thinks Plato's a villain to him. Uh, yep. Plato's a bad guy. Yep. Um, Plato gets certain things right, but Plato is a villain. Uh, no, so where there's not one place your hypotheses come from. So the first essay of his we read in my class is called "On the Sources of Knowledge and Ignorance," and he says the idea that there is a a source of knowledge is a mistake. There are many sources of not many fallible sources of knowledge. So, yeah, you might you know observe a, a little bit of a pattern in nature, and that suggests something to you. That's not an induction. That's just a suggestion. And any more than it's not an induction if your mom says all swans are white. It's just mm -hmm. gave you this idea. And where does it come from? It doesn't matter where it comes from. What matters is what you do with it once you have it. Do you subject it to the appropriate critical tests? Uh, and if you do subject it to the pro appropriate critical tests then it counts as knowledge in your mind. And I mean, if it passes the test, if, yeah. if it fails the test, then you reject it and you falsify it. Um, yeah, there's a there's a history of kind of uh, severing the discovery, the, the scientific discovery from scientific proof or justification. And Popper's definitely on the side of uh, keeping these two separate. There's questions about epistemology, and then there's questions about discovery which are um, psychological, historical, not not philosophical. So um, David asked a question this afternoon. Um, she says, uh, uh, 
his he, she says his falsification theory seems to be the most accepted idea in a demarcation of what is and is not science or the scientific method. Uh, how could Rand or how could we be opposed to that? Well, so one is it, it's what are you de demarcating from? So poppers in different um, way, interested in different things, several different things. How do you distinguish science from pseudoscience? or like a you know so-called conspiracy theory or something. And then how do you uh, distinguish or demarcate science from other like philosophy or, or metaphysics or something? Um, now, f for him, the answer is all, yeah, it's there's falsification plays a role. For Rand, the, I think the, those are just different. You wouldn't try to give a unified demarcation of science from non-science because there, that could be all kind of things like the what what makes science different from philosophy is different from what makes science different from al from like astrology um uh so uh that's that's one thing to say so for rand what's going to distinguish science from something like astrology is the very thing popper says is impossible which is well you need to have positive evidence in favor of your view of your uh, hypothesis of your theory in order for it to be um, epistemologically, you know, uh, legitimate to entertain. And it, Darwin's theory of evolution, for example, has loads of positive evidence in its favor. And uh, creation science has none. So mm -hmm. creation science is, is a, is a, is a, not a, not really a science, it's name notwithstanding. And Astra, what's the positive evidence that what astrological sign you're born under influences like whether or not you'll get a new job this week. There is, there's zero. Um, so the way she'll demarcate or she, you know, she doesn't really write about this, but the way she, I assume she would, if, if she were to take this up would be to just say, yeah, there's, it's really the difference between um, the possible and the arbitrary. So pseudoscience is a kind of dressed up elaborate arbitrary um, speculation, whereas science is uh then now there's the question of science versus rational non-science is a different question. Um, but just there between science and pseudoscience would be, I think about evidence and arbitrariness. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one of the features of a uh, good hypothesis that has evidence in its favor is that you can ask yourself the question, what could I learn that would cut against this or disprove it? And I mean, if you just, this is why I think Popper has a lot of cachet amongst uh, scientific, th the people who th think scientifically, is that it captures something right about good thinking. It's, yeah, I have this, um, uh, I have this view that, uh, um, you know, the, the SpaceX Starship will, um, you know, bring more mass to orbit than any other starship or any other spaceship. And you say, okay, well, what's my, I have positive evidence in that favor. They caught the thing and it's et cetera, et cetera. What would convince me otherwise? Well, okay. The real test is when it goes on the market. So if they start, you know, trying to sell um, launch, launch, uh, launch capabilities and they can't find any customers and the whole thing's a giant financial boondoggle, then that would, that would falsify my, and I could think ahead of time, like, okay, so I tell myself, once I get that information, I'll update my, um, my belief accordingly. And you could think about that as like, yeah, that could falsify what I believe. And that it's important to do that kind of thinking. I mean, you should always be thinking like, okay, what do I, what could I learn that might cut against what I, my, my current hypothesis? That's just good, you know, being objective. Um, I think there was more to the question that I haven't answered. Uh, I mean, really, is what is it about falsif falsificationism would Rand oppose? That is, it's a way okay, to yeah. Rand be against it as a theory of knowledge. Well, if you want to put the ism on it, where you're not just you're talking in the simplified way, like this test is going to, you know, refute my hypothesis. If you want to put the ism on, part of the falsification ism is that you can never establish that a theory is correct. Mm -hmm. You don't ever get supporting evidence. 
evidence only credit is only critical or refuting. Um, so that's, I mean, on its own, that's a major difference between um, I mean, not just Rand, but most people who are pro in the pro science category. You, yeah, you can get evidence in favor of a theory, and um, there's something you know, maybe somebody won't want to go in with for proof, but there's something like support or um, more probable. So um, if you've ever heard the idea that, well, evidence raises the probability of your hypothesis. Yep. This is kind of sometimes called Bayesian philosophy or ba Bayesian induction. Popper's against that too. So, you know, this way of thinking, say, okay, the, my hypothesis before I do my experiment is that I think it's 60% likely I do my experiment, I update my hypothesis. Now I think it's 90% likely. You might have somebody say, yeah, it can keep going like this. You never get to 100, which would be like certainty, mm -hmm. but you can, you know, get closer to certainty. And that's, you know, there's actually something called the Popper Miller theorem that they proved in probability theory to try to show you can't do this. Like Popper is very much opposed to any idea of supporting evidence, evidence that supports a claim, it's only um, conflicting, uh, you know, only evidence that would refute or that's, I mean, that it's built into the name, falsify the hypothesis. And and why is that? What is it against the positive that he's, that he's fighting against? What is it? That he yeah. So against? it's, it's the, it's the anti- anti-inductionism or the anti-justificationism um, mm. that you it's and it's it's not like you can do it but never get there it's that you just that's just not what we, we do in thinking rationally is you just have hypotheses it does just or conject like the name of his book is conjectures and reputations you just have a conjecture mm -hmm. and you know your conjectures presumably should be consistent with previous conjectures you've had that have that are not falsified but you're never going to prove or justify or give supporting evidence in favor what you can do is give evidence that it's false this is a, incidentally a, a, like a major uh thing that comes up when you read debates about particle physics and string theory it's like can you falsify this and what that, what the idea of that is like, well, uh, you know, there's some prediction from string theory that there's this particle and we'd need some super particle accelerator the size of the solar system to test it. So does that mean it's science because you can't really do it or, and you really get Popperian type debates about this, about, yeah, if you can't test this string theory, then it's not science, it's, it's metaphysics or it's philosophy. Um, and that's all Popperian terms. It's about make a prediction that we can check. And if the prediction fails, we say, okay, that was a wrong theory. So how does his idea that um, knowledge is fallible, right, that there's no certainty, fit with Rand's notion of truth is contextual? Oh, that's a good, uh, good question. Um, so Popper does think that theories are true or approximate the truth. Sorry, he thinks not that they're true, that they approximate the truth. Mm -hmm. And the conception of truth he has is a kind of so-called correspondence view. It's like, does your theory um, line up with the facts of reality? That kind of, yeah. that kind of view. So at least on the surface, he has a similar view of truth to Rand I think really actually he doesn't, but that's because I don't think she's actually, she says she's a correspondence theorist. I don't think she is. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of uh, tangent, but um, no. So what she means by truth is contextual is that it's the context of your hypothesis or of your theory that tells you what the actual meaning and content of the theory is. So you can't really, say um if you take the example from uh dr peakoff's uh opar objectivism and philosophy of ayn rand the book um he gives this example of uh um the discovery of the different types of blood the a b um a b o and then the rh factor the, the positive or negative and if you if 
think about what it means to say that it's true that A, blood types are compatible. The idea is that part of what that means is the evidentiary context within which somebody arrived at that conclusion. So when I say that A and B or A types are compatible, what I'm doing is pointing to a certain type of, you know, a type of blood and I'm not making any claims about whether there are additional factors that might, it might be relevant. Um, so I, I don't, so how does false, was the, your own was your question, how does falsification? How do you pronounce it? The, the, the idea that it's all fallible? Really oh, fa fa fallibilism, yeah. Well, yeah, the, the whole idea is, that we're constantly approaching the truth, but we don't, we can never. Okay, so it. that's, yeah, but that's. That related yeah. To knowledge is contextual in the yeah, sense that's, that. That's different from the fallibilism. So yeah, it is different. But yeah, the fallibilism is just that. Um, there's no source of of knowledge or conjecture that's infallible. It's they're all all error prone. Um, the I think the word you're searching for is verisimilitude. Is the pop yeah. Is, yeah truth likeness. We'll yeah. never make it into my vocabulary. That's yeah, just, I know. That's, probably that's, shouldn't. That's the it's, a, it's a term you only need if you're interested in Popper and some some of his critics. Yeah. Um, so the idea of truth likeness. No, I, I think it's a it's a it's a just a different um, concept. It's uh, it, the for it, at least I, as far as I know, for Rand, Rand is going to say no. Truth is binary. Something's true or false. There's not you know this seem the idea of truth likeness doesn't that push against the law of excluded middle that something could be not quite true, not quite false. Um, I, I don't see a, a, a relationship between that concept and the idea of contextual truth because the context there is sort of conditioning what does it what does the thing you're saying is true even mean? Um, and what does it mean to say that a blood types are compatible? And that that's what the context is doing. But whether or not they're compatible is just that's either true or false. Um, yeah, so that's a it's a uh, no, I, I think that's a Good question to ask, but I think they're just different, uh, different issues. So, so why do you think Papa is a good foil to objectivism? Why why is it worth studying Papa for objectivists? Why do we gain more yeah. clarity about objectivism by doing so? So, I I think so for a number. So, one is anytime you can like for any uh, systematic thinker that you're trying to understand putting them in, uh, uh, setting them up against another one is just illuminating for both. So mm -hmm. if you want to understand be Plato better, you have to think about, okay, well, how would, what would Aristotle say about this? Like that's, that'll just help you. So Rand's no different to think about Rand and objectivism. You'd want to, okay, so what would Kant say about this? I mean, she does it herself. Like here's what Kant said, here's why I'm anti-Kantian and here's Plato. And so um, just because she only talked about Plato, Aristotle and Kant at any length, you know, doesn't mean we can't, or in dialogue with someone else. Um, so there's that's just the generic point. The other is, uh, I said earlier, there's not a lot of systematic thinkers who are grappling with 20th century, big picture 20th century issues, uh, specifically the rise of communism and Marxism and uh, more broadly totalitarianism. So he's uh, one of the few along with Rand. So there's a valid or, or a fruitful point of comparison um, there. Also because... He's a in in certain ways and in certain moods. It's really striking that the way in which he's thinking about these questions are similar to Rand's. Like he's really so he's says he's an in, and he uses the terms individualism versus collectivism. And it's like it, it, I I used to when I was new to objectivism. Was, Nobody else talks this way. Like who. Who says it's occasionally like I'd hear some conservative do, but then they'd say, I got this from Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. So um so that there's somebody else thinking in those terms is I think is oh, are they really on the are they on the same, you know, coming from the same place, or are they arriving at some similar position from different arguments? Are these arguments uh complementary or inconsistent? Like those are interesting questions to ask about um about Rand the and the and the other, um, uh, another point on this is that he's interested in not just, you know, here's why you know, this is more like a Hayek. 
here's why totalitarianism or socialism won't work or a Mises, why there's a calculation problem um, that, you know, markets work uh, and you destroy the markets. You won't have certain information. So you can't be productive. It's like how he's more, how did we get here? Like the line was away from authoritarianism towards individual freedom for a long time. And then it seemed like we did a complete 180 somewhere around, you know, 1925 or whatever, pick your year. Um, how did we get to that place? And his diagnosis of that is um, deep philosophical rot that goes back to the origins of the Enlightenment. And just in, at that level of description, Rand says the same thing. Um, now, again, it's coming from, I think of Popper as uh, a, um, there's a, a phrase I got from, I think it's from Leonard Peikoff's dim, dim hypothesis, hypothesis that I like. He calls them knowing skeptics. Mm -hmm. I think that really describes Popper. Like he does not want to be a skeptic. He'll tell you he's not a skeptic, but he doesn't think scientific theories are true or can be proved. He likes science. He doesn't want to wind up in skepticism. I mean, the whole line of philosophy of science that happens in his wake that I mentioned, the people, Feyerabend, Robin, Lakatosh, Kuhn, they're skeptics. There's, you know, they like science, but they're like, yeah, they, you know, this is just, um, uh, you know, this is, we can't say this is objectively true. It's just, you know, uh, useful, whatever. Um, so he's a kind of pro-science, science, 20th century, big picture thinker who uh, asks interesting question, questions, has original answers, and has, um, uh, it, at a certain level of abstraction, very similar answers to Rand. Now, uh, when you get into this, it's really, he's a kind of moderate Kantian about knowledge and, uh, and philosophy. But mm -hmm. my, at least my observation is that the only real philosophers for the last 150 years are Kantians anyway. So it's not kind of surprising. Is they're the only ones who are actually doing the subject philosophy as Rand would see it. Yeah.